yourself. Like another class this morning, talking about, you know, like this strange, for me it's persistently a strange phenomenon that, you know, the most privileged members of the privileged class of the empire choose, up, choose to dress in the, you know, kind of clothes of the dispossessed. You know, in body and bew into themselves like sort of the rage of rap that comes out of American ghettos. And so you get these kind of scenes, you know, you sort of like which are sort of authentic. On the one hand, people feel rage. And on the other hand, you say, well, it's still it's a marketeer is going around and saying, here's otherness, here's like a difference, and we'll sort of absorb this difference as kind of an exotic coding. We can in fact market that itself. What happens when contemporary capitalism doesn't simply do propaganda in the old way, but says in fact what we're going to do is we're going to like harvest the world for forms of gender difference and racial difference and difference of any sign at all, any forms of ex kind of exotic coding which we can sort of market and sell itself. And what happens when we're like the subjects and sort of like, you know, streaming within this kind of media network itself and those become like satisfactory forms of identity to us, like sort of forms of a prosthetic identity. So Lisa Nakamura's article for me on identity tourism, this last article in the section of cyber colonization, you know, one of the last articles section of cyber colonization, really begins to put the question very seriously, have we all become identity tourists? Like as part of the culture of globalization, technological globalization within which we live, is part and parcel of this culture sort of like, I don't know what it would be called, like sort of, that it's like a, a culture of phantom ghosts in some ways. It's a culture of like harvesting, you know, taking onto ourselves as our own identity, a language of racial difference, a language of gender difference, you know, a language of difference of all the signs, and that becomes our identity for a day, and then we pass on to something else. So Lisa Nakamura's article, you know, when I read it, it sort of took it out, so I took, is interesting in and of its own right, and then I sort of took it out one step and said, well, have we all become identity tourists? What's the relationship of this article to our experience within the net itself? So that's, you know, like Lisa Nakamura. And just, uh, let's see if I can find these. I just want to read one paragraph from what she's on page 17, 718 of this text, where Lisa Nakamura says, she says, right at the beginning of the, right at the end of the article, she says, you know, because it's really a crit like an article that just begins like so deceptive, eh? Because it begins like a specific discussion of a lambda mu. You're in a chat room. You're, you know, the, um, you know, there's no emphasis being placed on coding questions of race and coding questions of gender. And yet when you begin to code it yourself and you say, well, I'm not male and I'm not white, then you're sort of flamed because in fact, you know, you're like a, you know, like a movie plea within the chat room itself. But you then say, well, What's this mean in terms of if you, in fact, are like a member of a minority group, in fact, your racial otherness itself, and you find, in fact, that your race and your gender is implicitly sort of screened out and disappeared in terms of the cyber codes that are being put down. And Lisa Nakamura then sort of builds on that at the end of the article. Then she asks, you know, the fundamental question. She says, just on the about five or six lines down on page 17, page 718, she says, Indeed, the cost of, the, uh, cost of net access does contribute towards class divisions as well as racial ones. The vast majority of the Internet's users are white and middle class. One of the dangers of identity tourism is that it takes this restriction across the axis of race and class in the real world to an even more subtle and complex degree by reducing non-white identity positions to part of a costume or masquerade to be used by curious vacationers in cyberspace. Asianness is co-opted as a passing fancy an identity prosthesis which signifies sex, the exotic, passivity when female, and an anach anachronistic dreams of combat in its male manifestation. Passing a sumerai or geisha is diverting reversible and a privilege mainly used by white men. The paradigm of Asian passing masquerades and lambda mu itself works to suppress racial difference by setting the tone of discourse and racist contours which inevitably discourage real life Asian men and women from textual performances in that space, effectively driving the question of race underground. As a result, a default whiteness covers the entire social space of this lambda mu. Race is whited out in the name of cyber social hygiene. And then she turns this by saying, 
The dream of a new technology has always contained within it the fear of total control and the accompanying loss of individual autonomy. Perhaps the best way to subvert the hegemony, the, you know, the control of cyber social hygiene, is to use its own metaphors against itself. Racial and racist discourse in the Mu is a unique product of a machine and an ideology. Looking at discourse about race in cyberspace as a computer bugger, ghost, and machine permits insight into the ways that it subverts that machine. A bug interrupts a program's regular com commands and routines, causing it to behave unpredictably. Bugs are mistake or unexpected occurrences as opposed to things that are, they are intentional. And then lines, a few lines down. Discourse about race in cyberspace, from, from Lisa Nakamura's perspective, is conceptualized as a bug, something which an efficient computer user would eradicate since it contaminates their work play. And then she ends the article by saying, well, race matters, bodies matter. Player scripts which eschew repressive versions of the Oriental in favor of critical rearticulations and recombinations of race, gender, and class, and which also call the fixity of these categories into question, have the power to turn the theatrically, theatricality characteristic of Moose space into a truly innovative, innovative form of play rather than a tired reiteration. So Lisa Nakamura on the question of racial coding, you know, not to ask the question simply, does technology have a sex, but does technology have a race? And she answers, yes, it does have a race. It has a race because it's related to questions of power, and the race that it has is whiteness. And so she says, well, why not, in fact, turn the question of, you know, the whiteness of race on its own head? Why not do something theatrical? Why not begin to privilege questions of race? Why not begin to privilege questions of gender? Why not, in fact, take what is assumed to be impolite to talk about, which is the actual context out of which a real body begins to speak, and begin, in fact, to play that within the space itself? You know, what I would say that she does is she really hacks the question of race just as much as other articles that we've examined begin to hack the question of gender. You know, they really don't operate in terms of, you know, the critical ask question they ask of technology is that they're not trying to operate outside the language of technology. They're trying to operate within its space itself and begin to sort of, you know, introduce, you know, disturbances and dirt and kind of interruptions and things which can't be explained into this space that really wants to be as hygienic as possible. So Lisa Nakamura's article I thought was really interesting because she takes the question of identity tourism, starts with a simple description, and then really makes it into like a really critical political position in a general sense of a position itself. So it's identity tourism. So Lisa Nakamura. Do you have any questions on Lisa Nakamura? Do you follow that? Yeah. OK, so <laughs> if I haven't explained it well, I apologize. <laughs> the, but I just, for myself, that article really was important. Because I thought, well, remember we, before we talked about you know, the article on you know, prosthetic identity and prosthetic memories. Well, when I read Lisa Nakamura's article, I thought, well, that's really the same. It's almost as if when you go into the net, you also can have like a prosthetic gender. You can have a prosthetic race. And the good thing about having a prosthetic race, you know, from the point of view, if you have like particularly white maleness on the net, poor white males, is in fact, it's in the form of the exotic. You can take them on. And then you can just sort of, you know, do a click, and they go off, and you fall back into your real life position itself. And Lisa Nakamura, I thought, put the very good point. She says, "Well, what in fact, if you can't take off your race? What if you can't, in fact, simply step out of your gender? What's the actual question in relationship of questions of race and gender and class position to net technology, to the technological scene within which we live? What is the real meaning of globalization?" Is globalization delivering us to a free market utopia, or is globalization delivering us to forms of cyber colonization, where very traditional forms of, you know, of, you know, a hierarchy in terms of questions of race and gender and class are just being coded onto a world market? Is the global village just really a colonized kind of global village itself? Have we become ourselves kind of vampiric? 
identity tourists and identity robbers, like sort of grave diggers of identity, putting on and taking off the exotic identities as we will, moving through the identity of the net. And you pick it up on television, eh? but a lot of television, like the reality shows, are all based on identity tourism. Like these idiot shows, like Survivor, I mean, like, not idiot, these wonderful shows, Survivor, you know, all of them. Like these shows where you get guys and women going down to like the Australian outback and being like Aboriginal for a day or for a week or something like this. And these, you know, horrible things they do, like eating bugs and stuff like this, the suffering and, you know, the, the p trials of pain that they have to go through and things like this. And then, you know, the contest is decided, kind of bored listeners or bored viewers are sort of watching back, sort of interested or not interested. And then they're out of there. And then everything follows. And that's Lisa Nakamura's point. She's really asking the point, to what extent in terms of total immersion within media culture is our subject position identity tourists? To what extent have we become almost vampiric? You know, vampiric in terms of taking like soul possession and body possession of exotic otherness itself. And that becomes like really part of like our nature in some kind of ways, you know, part of the nature of a consumer. So that's Lisa Nakamura's article. Now, do you want to talk about paintings? <laughs> <laughs> Fiber bodies. And I just wanted to begin with uh, this piece that we published today by Dion Dennis, because we began the class by talking of, you know, really the kind of drift of bodies and identity tourism, or what's meant by identity tourism itself. And what does it mean when, in fact, we sort of live within, in, uh, swim within a sea of images? And, you know, we see like a film like After Darwin. And after Darwin talks about the sort of radical shift of the body and what happens of the body itself. And I thought, well, and this piece from Dion Dennis came in and writing out of Texas and says this, they first appeared in the summer of 2002, driving across the major interstate highways in San Antonio, large white billboards emerged with a few words and evocative graphics. They sell simple pro-social virtues. For example, one such billboard is composed of two elements, the visual elements, the evocative depiction of a young blonde white girl of five or six. Her arms, head and eyes are extended upwards as if she's ready to take flight from her father's shoulders. At the top of the photo extended from her right hand, colorful and vibrant as it descends above a dark sea of brown heads is a vivid and bright American flag. The second text, the second element, the text is to the right of the picture. It proclaims what makes us great, unity, pass it on. Below this is the foundation for a better life. Across from the University of Texas at San Antonio, another at the foundation's billboards in the same format delivers a message that I found foreboding. On the left, the visuals taken from the ruins of the World Trade Center amidst the rubble two ash crusted New York firemen hoist up an American flag, again composed so it's at the top of the visual frame. In front of the collapsed vertebrae of one of the towers, the text to the right of the picture reads, no setback will set us back. Determination, pass it on. And again, just below this much smaller type, the foundation for a better life, evoking, yikes, evoking the urban devastation of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the flag raising at Iwo Jima, the terroristic tragedy the WTC was deployed in imagery well suited to prepare a population for an imminent campaign of total war. These are just on just this last paragraph. These are just a small sample of an ongoing and prominent multimedia campaign almost entirely ignored by the, by the media, 10,000 of these billboards, bus placards, and signs all evocatively depicting simple virtues such as courage and perseverance have been planted across the major highways and thoroughfares of the U.S. in 2002. The reach of the televised, the foundation's ads is impressive. On their homepage is this claim, that they're being seen two million times per day on seven networks and over 900 radio TV stations they're also being shown in the United Artists Regal and Edwards movie theaters, totaling over 6,000 screens. Pass it on. Pass it on. <laughs> Telematically, as it were. What makes us great? Pass it on. <laughs> no. Bowling for Columbine? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's that's very true. That's really true. 
But the bullying from Columbine also is another thesis that what makes America great is exactly what the filmmaker would in fact perhaps find wrong, and that is regenerative violence. You know, the thesis of the movie is that violence is American as Apple, not American personality, but the structure, his sense of violence within the culture. Yeah, so maybe the fascination with violence, maybe the belief that violence has a kind of regenerative quality about it. Case in point, the Civil War. Did you watch Ken Burns' depiction of the American Civil War? If you go down to the Pittsburgh War Museum, there will be a sign outside the museum showing the number of casualties in the First World War and the Second World War and in what they call the Vietnam conflict. And then the Civil War, one million, I mean, just dwarfing any other war or conflict itself. And when you watch Ken, when I watch Ken Burns, um, you know, you know, his PBS series on this, you know, which is done in sepia tones, old photographs, maudlin music coming over it, I found for myself it was like the sense of like in, in his thesis of the the uh, you know the this series on the the Civil War itself was that you know the Civil War was not just about basic conflict, but it had actually a redemptive outcome. That it was a terrible process of regenerative violence, but the outcome of the process of regenerative violence, in fact, was a transfiguration of the possibility of the nation, one union under God, sepia tones, taking both you know the animating spirit of the South and sort of the techno spirit of the North and beginning to fuse the two. So maybe what separates, in this sense, the American makes a difference and makes it really receptive to the language of technology is really the America as a society, the receptivity to making and remaking yourself, to making and remaking the culture, to taking the differences of the culture and beginning to fuse them together and to bind them together itself. Or maybe it's something else. Maybe, in fact, it's the, the Dion Dennis argues in this. He says, really, the way in which propaganda operates today is in the language of the invocation of simple virtues, the invocation of you know identity tourism, white girl, five or six, American flag in her hand, all the dominant icons in the hand itself. And you begin to see that and begin to identify with that, you know, and it's like virtues of s simplicity, virtues of peace itself. Or later on in this article, when let's see if I can just get to it. It's a little bit later on in this article. Yikes. Sorry about this. Yeah, this piece right here. It says, my fondest memory of my dad occurred one summer in the middle of a mountain lake. Don't jerk it, just reel it in slow, my father whispered, but it was so difficult. I, hesitated, I hated to wait for anything. I usually took forever to decide what I really wanted. But once I decided I wanted it right now, and right now I wanted to catch a fish. My father sense, seemed to sense my impatience. Quote, the big ones didn't get that way by snapping the first thing to hit the water, he said quietly. You'll soon find that anything big and worthwhile usually takes a lot of time. Then with a smile I'll never forget, he added, after all, I've already spent 12 years on you. The values we live by are worth more when we pass them on, pass it on. Determination, courage. And you know the article then goes on to say, well, what is the nature of the contemporary media scape within which we live? What is its media, the, the series of media signs have to say about political propaganda? What kind of culture do they invoke itself? What kind of society are we going to be identity tourists within? What is both privileged and what disappears in the language of just pass it on? And what if you, in fact, are a member of the community that doesn't want to pass anything on at all? What if you, in fact, don't find yourself identifying with a young white girl of five or six years of age? What if, in fact, you have different memories of your father than why anything worthwhile is going to take, you know, 12 years to, you know, slowly prepare it? After all, I've spent, you know, 12 years in you. Just pass it on. What if you, in fact, don't want to be part of the bonded community? What if you find yourself sort of other to the community <coughs> itself? So this, art, this article I just found really courageously written. 
coming out of the middle of Texas and really just looking at this media campaign, you know, which goes like sort of like under the radar, goes on billboards, not taking those overtly political. How can you be critical of it? It's talking of the simple virtues itself. The article then goes on to say, well, maybe in this, if we just, you know, if Deion Dennis and his perspective begin to think about it, maybe it has to say about the kind of bodies that we have become, like cyber bodies that we have become, and maybe its analysis of it will have something to say about the way in which propaganda works today, how, in fact, bonded, tightly bonded communities are created. You're either with us or you're against us. You're either with us and you will pass it on, these simple social virtues repeated in kind of like uh, Roland Barthes says, like a repetition machine over and over again. Or in fact, if you don't want to pass it on, well, I guess you're against us. You're against the community itself. And what happens to when the language of propaganda doesn't talk to us, us in the language of simply politicians <laughs> giving us lessons, but speaks to us in the language which we want to accept, which we want to be sort of bonded with. So what is the nature of these cyber bodies within which we appear all the time? So, did you have your hand up? Jed, you want to? Yeah, the uh, partially uh, Christian fundamentalism, partially a very large media conglomerate, like the movie theaters that they, the Regal, the Edward, et cetera, all of which they own. The screens that they're putting on, all of which they own. And so it's like this kind of complete fusion of private, you know, corporatism and capitalism on the one hand. and this invocation of kind of a message of bonding itself. So Dion Dennis then proceeds to do an analysis. Just like just go up and see theory net and just it just went was posted today. Just go through because he really focuses on that question. He says, who is this foundation for a better life? And then proceeds to do the analysis of where it comes from. And then asks the question, well what is the relationship in his terms between you know the foundation for a better life, pass it on, and this really kind of seductive campaign and what's its relationship to like propaganda the way that in the Second World War that Goebbels talked about propaganda itself. Goebbels also talked about things like if you're going to convince anyone of some use simple social virtues, talk in the language of a bonded community, talk subtly but convincingly of a community of ourselves and a community of others, pass it on. Oh that's really nice. Pass it on. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I wouldn't. I wasn't making it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's it's really good. And the the cement of the social values is the desire is in America, you know, the, and beyond that, I'm speaking as an American and trying to reflect on this culture in a really troubled time, says in fact that America and other this writing and other writings talks about America as a community that's very receptive to this. Because America is a community in which you come and you make and remake your identity to be part of the American dream, to be part of the American community itself. And what happens when you, in fact, have forms of otherness that really are fundamentally disturbing, create a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety? Like what have you been through two years of you know, massive media images, a media assault of images of terrorism through threats to the community of like unknown snipers anthrax, you know, like real forms of like threat to the community itself. So Pass It On really appeals to a desire to unify pre-existing bonds of community itself in its kind of simple social virtues. So is it really, yes, I'm sorry. Um, uh, D-wired. Really, 
are you saying that there is this because what happens when you're outside you don't have a yes you don't go outside because you're afraid of the virus yeah no that's a really and i think that that's really key actually and i think that that's in fact psychologically what this kind of campaign it's a campaign which really is political but it operates in like a libidinal language a language of desire and a language of I desire to belong. I don't want to be against. I desire to belong itself. And simple social virtues. I mean, that's really interesting. And so it's really interesting that even from a critical standpoint, the dominant value is to belong to the group. And the most terrible thing would be is if you're exiled from the group, you find yourself sort of ostracized from the group. Like, I mean, this campaign, after all, political campaign, and so I'm not saying this in any partisan way, hopefully, um, the political campaign, though, was very skillfully orchestrated to identify who belonged to the group and who was outside the group. Like that senator from Georgia, did he follow the campaign? Did he, have you followed this, the campaign, the midterm election for yesterday? You're too busy writing your papers and stuff like this. Well, the campaign in Georgia was really interesting because here's a guy, a Democratic senator running. His name is uh, Cleland, if I, if I get the name correct. And he's a Vietnam War vet. He lost limbs in Vietnam, so he comes back, you know, amputated. He, uh, when others, you know, either through principle, you know, came to Canada and didn't go to war, or simply avoided the draft, like most of political leadership in the United States, it seems, and most of the elite. He, in fact, served his time, went to war, lost his limbs. So in the true blue kind of fashion, he's a patriot. He was then in Clinton's cabinet, I believe, as a vet, you know, minister, whatever, the foreign affairs or whatnot. So he goes back and he becomes the senator in Georgia. It looked like he was going to close to an easy re-election until D-Day, which is to say in, in the Senate when he was one of the few senators who did not vote for the United States to go to war, to give a, a check for the United States to declare war when it wanted to on Iraq itself, one of the few dissenting senators. He, in fact, was outside the group. Well, as soon as he did that, his opponent in Georgia then just climbed up and began to climb in the polls rapidly and then defeated him yesterday on the grounds was that he's not a true American patriot. His opponent is a person who avoided the draft and has no military service, you know, which in American rhetoric you know, counts for something. But I think now it's sort of been flipped itself. And I would say that that's part of the, you know, the political language of the society that, in fact, is you know, really groupal in character. And ad campaigns like this, then, are really important because they identify, in some ways, who belongs to the group and what kind of media images belong to the group itself. So let me go on with cyber bodies. We want to use these two examples of Lisa Nakamura on identity tourism. You know, it's like cyber bodies and what are points of resistance in questions of gender and race. And this uh, work from Dion Dennis in, you know, priming the pump towards a post-ethnic, post-racial fascism, which presents also cyber bodies. And the cyber bodies, it doesn't present you know, like a young African-American five or six-year-old very consciously presents a young white uh, female five or six-year-old, you know, holding the American flag itself. And the section that we're going to deal with, you know, in cyber bodies, this next section of the book itself, you know, really has images like these in mind, in this in mind, and really wants to talk about, you know, the fact that, you know, if you live in contemporary culture, that we live sort of like in this kind of like very unique historical period, which is sort of like live in at least two different sorts of bodies all the time. You know, like a physical body, which has got, you're coded by race, you're coded by gender, coded by class. You know, like all the, the codings occur. And at the same time, we're all sort of at the same time living within like a, you know, like an electronic sea of images. You know, identity tourists, like Lisa Nakamura wants to write about or Dion Dennis, who's living down in Texas, teaching at like a systems operator at some college, you know, he's like a nomadic teacher, who's also living within a sea of electronic images itself. And, you know, in this section, you'll have writers like Alec Carey or Roseanne Stone, Sandy Stone, a performance artist, you know, saying, will the real body please stand up? You know, at what point, in fact, are we affected by like the real context within which our bodies, you know, pass through life? And at what point are we sort of like subsumed within like electronic culture? Will the real body real stand up or will the real body stand up? And the the like the opening, you know, the the um, the context out of which these articles come in cyber bodies is this notion that in the 
into the 20th and the 21st centuries like an accelerating pace, like something really fundamental is happening to the body itself. And to speak of a cyber body is not like to speak of an abstract exercise, but to speak of something really fundamental. Like in this class, we saw the film After Darwin, right? And After Darwin, you know, I thought was really interesting for any number of reasons. But one reason was that it really signaled, it led many levels of discussion and the kind of apprehension and anxieties in the film that something really radical is happening to the human body itself. Like when you can speak about cloning and genetic engineering and amniocentesis and like technological intrusions into the body itself and the image of the body, then in fact you're talking to the body which is undergoing really a radical shift. And that film and the articles that we've been dealing with and the articles that certainly are going to deal in this section on cyber bodies are going to say that you know, like in, from an engineering point of view and from a genetic engineering point of view and from the point of view of the electronic images which sort of just stream through the culture and we find ourselves sort of, you know, whether we like it or not, sort of navigating through, you know, physically it's happening. The electronic world is like really changed and sort of like time shifted us or speed shifted us into another space itself. And all these articles then ask the really fundamental question from different points of view that this might have happened from a technological point of view but are we emotionally prepared for this change? Are we intellectually prepared for this change? Or are we ethically prepared for the change? And it sort of goes back to, you know, to the writings of like a lot of earlier theorists, you know, beginning with Marshall McLuhan and others, who really just said, you know, like writing in the middle of the 20th century, that something really fundamental is happening to the body itself, saying that in evolutionary terms, we've had like, what, 35,000 years of recorded history. And during that time, we've gone like from just massively from one cultural envelope to another. You know, we lit up the skies with speech, ended isolation, moved to phonetic writing, to the phonetic alphabet, moved to silent reading. And then someone like Marshall McLuhan then stops and says, well, the act of silent reading in itself is really important because in the act of silent reading, suddenly, you know, we, you know, like the community of oral culture suddenly ends and we sort of go private within ourselves. And only in the last hundred years or so, at this kind of absolutely accelerating pace, do we suddenly do like a big evolutionary shift to electronic culture. And the whole seminar, has been, the course has been taken up and thinking about like, you know, radio and television and computer culture, the mediascape within which we exist. And our bodies are sort of like born and they're like blasted into this different space. And Sandy Stone in her article will say, you know, usually we're th we think you know, we, we are like educated to think of like that there are like sort of like binary divisions, that there's a self and another, that there's our self and there's a nature, you know, a thing called nature, that there's our self and there's a thing called technology. And she asked the question, she says, well, maybe what's happened in the midst of this kind of crash of the culture, like the speed up of the culture, is in fact that, you know, the divisions have sort of disappeared and that the real nature that we exist within is technology itself. And that, you know, we know technology is sort of like our deepest form of nature, and maybe it's even become part of human nature. Now, Marshall McLuhan and others said that every technological shift has major cultural consequences. Marshall McLuhan said that, like, when you move to silent reading, the Gutenberg galaxy, when you actually begin to read the actual written text itself, it doesn't simply create, you know, conditions for literacy but creates like a profound cultural change. He said silent reading actually took oral communities inside. The act of silent reading, privileging the eye, the act of the interior reading of the text, suddenly was responsible in his terms for what we later come to call the creation of the privatized ego, kind of meditative space within which we find ourselves. It privileges not talking stories, orally telling stories to one another, having an oral history of our culture, it begins to privilege a prosthetic memory. And the prosthetic memory will be at that point the memory of what we have read, the kind of virtual memories of what we have read. It begins to privilege not collective consciousness, but individual consciousness. And so like a really, I think like such a really interesting person like Marshall McLuhan would say, this has real consequences. This means, in fact, you can really, the act of, you know, silent reading really gives rise to, like, liberal culture in some ways. 
which is based on the notion of like, you know, the celebration of individuality, the celebration of individual consciousness. So Marshall McLuhan would say these kind of cyber bodies in advance in the act of silent reading, when technologies happen, they have huge major cultural consequences. And the cultural consequences which affect people and affect cultures very deeply are oftentimes not appreciated until like 100 or 200 years after the event has happened. And the only problem with that is that in contemporary culture, if we don't learn a way of like fast forwarding the consequences, thinking ahead to the consequences of major technological shifts which happen with great rapidity, then in fact, as like a film like After Darwin says, you know, the human species itself will be harvested. We will find ourselves in a, you know, in a kind of cloner culture and major questions, which really just big ethical discussion, will already sort of be codified in practice. You know, the technology imposes its consequences, and we need to find a way of like sort of fast forwarding or speeding up in some ways, like awareness of the consequences itself. So with electronic technologies, what someone like Marshall McLuhan warned us against in terms of the act of reading becomes much more fundamental. Because Marshall McLuhan says with electronic technologies like radio and television and cinema, we suddenly jump out of the private imagination into a collective trance, into a collective trance. And there's a really good French writer, his name is Paul Virilio. And Paul Virilio, in this book that I think is a fantastically important book called War and Cinema, said that cinema, with its emphasis on light, with its emphasis on moving illuminated images, retrieves actually something that's not new. It actually retrieves something that's very ancient. It brings back the sun cult of the ancient Egyptians. It brings back the sun cult of the ancient, ancient Egyptians. Except this time, rather than simply celebrating passively the sun cult of the Asian Egyptians, instead of simply being passive spectators to a culture which is suddenly lit up, our position is really different. Suddenly the world is lit up literally with dynamic images. Pass it on. Be an identity tourist. We find ourselves actually swimming in an electronic sea of images moving at the speed of light. We find ourselves swimming in an electronic sea of images moving at the speed of light. That the sun doesn't remain outside of ourself, but kind of collective trance in sort of like the headlights of a culture, which gives us like the light of a sun moving at the speed of light, suddenly becomes the context, the milieu, the environment within which we are like sort of embraced. And the question that every one of these authors in this section on cyber bodies talks about in one way or another, you know, Diane, Deborah Lufton and Anne Balsamo, and Ella Carey or Sandy Stone, the question that they ask, and I think the reason for their writing the article is to say, if was asked something very simple. If you find yourself within a sea of electronic images moving at the speed of light, and if those images are you know, moving with like such unpredictable consequences that they have actually already altered our sense of time, so that we just laconically can say, this is real time, by which we mean is it net time, or is it kind of real globalized space, by which we mean we can be conscious globally of a whole variety of things happening you know, which we don't physically see, but we've become aware of things, you know, that space itself becomes to become immediate and simultaneous, and everybody's mind almost becomes like a global United Nations in some ways. The question they ask is a very simple one. They say, well, whose imagination can keep up with this? And how much stress does this put on the body? Who can reflect actually on the impact of electronic culture when we are not either, you know, we're not like inheritors of electronic culture that came before, but we're actually riding at the tip of the electronic storm. When you're like sitting in a class in media, technology, and politics, and someone posts an article today, writing today, you know, like out of Texas, and says that these billboards 10,000 of them are like on the highways of America, pass it on. And he's not doing a historical analysis of this. He's asking as like a critical and anguished American citizen, 
what does it mean in terms of my understanding of politics and of reflection and imagination? What is a slogan which I find vaguely foreboding? What does it mean, pass it on? What does it mean when 9-11 is like recuperated by the culture and the scenes which are valorized are scenes of like, you know, the devastation of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but all sort of valorized by the firemen who are posed, you know, craftily posed, holding the flag as an instant kind of ideological invocation of that other famous posed photograph, the holding of the Marines who are holding the flag over Iwo Jima, which of course was a staged communication. What does it mean to be a cyber body living in a culture of what the French thinker Jean Baudrillard said is a culture which is all about staged communications? What happens when we have to think not retrospectively or a culture, and we don't even have the time to think prospectively or projectively about what's going to happen in the future, but when we are literally in our own bodies are the tip of the electronic storm itself? What happens when through the net and through the mediascape that our bodies have been opened up, have literally been opened up, and that we are always available for communication? We are always in one way or another online when we become cyber bodies. And what happens when, just when we think we're beginning to think of through the consequences of an electronic culture and sort of you know, can figure out what's happening with the internet and can think about real time versus like a time of duration and think about real space and you know, questions of cyber gender and cyber sexuality. And instantly the whole discourse gets shifted and we're no longer living simply a culture of technology as the electronic storm, but we're living in a culture of biogenetics, a culture of genetic engineering. And finally, the meaning of being wired is combined with something else the possibilities of being cloned, the possibilities, in fact, of the fabrication of artificial species, the fabrication of artificial parts of the human body itself. And then you find yourself saying, well, should, what is an ethical position in this? And you want to be critical, but then you say, well, on the other hand, if you have a feeling heart, or you're a bad spleen, or you have a bad back or something of the sort, well, who wouldn't want to have new forms of therapeutic medicine, which use, you know, med medically the benefits of molecular engineering itself. And you then begin to read the ads of, you know, the wonderful benefits that will come from genetic engineering and from molecular biology applied to medicine itself. But all at the same time, where you're hearing this kind of language, ideological language of facilitation, welcoming us to a world of genetic engineering and molecular biology, Images from the electronic storm pass through your head. Those kind of haunting images of redesigning the body, of growing headless bodies to harvest organs. Those pig farms, you know, just ready to be put into existence, where tens of thousands of animals will be grown for the harvesting of very specialized organs from their bodies itself. Stories of scientists who, without like even a murmur of discontent or without any notion that there might be you know, something ethically wrong with this, can think of these laboratory mice and say laconically, why well, I proved my experiment at the moment of birth, the same day they were born, I slipped 400 open of them. I performed experiments which you know, made them experience pain and then I waited to see what the reactions to the pain were. And then, you know, at least for myself when I say that, I say, well, I hear of these experiments on animals, and I know of the experiments on plants, but is it possible that what the writers in this section and cyber bodies are concerned about is that maybe we ourselves have become subjects of the experiment, sort of unknowing subjects of the experiment which is going on. So one experiment which Marshall McLuhan would say, and of which Marshall McLuhan had a great expression. I mean, Marshall McLuhan's taken by Wired magazine as the icon of the utopian future of technology. And it's a big lie. Just go read Marshall McLuhan, this Catholic thinker, you know, deeply, deeply pessimistic thinker, like just despairingly pessimistic about technology. And McLuhan said, what, do you say to, what are you to say to people when they insist in sticking their heads in the invisible buzz teeth of the buzzsaw of technology and calling the whole thing freedom and yelling for more? <laughs>
He says, what happens in technology is technology is always medical. Technology always is performs surgery on the human species. It performs violent surgery on the human species. And Marshall McLuhan, thinking about that then, said, but yet we are receptive to the language of technology. And we're receptive to the language of technology because for better or for worse, an indispensable part of our identity is technology. We are technological beings. So what, pro to what are the ethical consequences of this project to which we have committed ourselves? And then Marshall McLuhan said, well, if we can't get out of it, then at least through the act of thinking and the act of reflecting, the act of doing art, the act of writing essays, we can at least begin to throw lifelines to those who come after us. If we are trapped in what he called the technological maelstrom, the technological electronic storm, then at least we can find, you know, throw lifelines in the forms of books and essays and aphorisms and collective reflections to those who come after it ourselves. And I would say, in reading this section on cyber bodies, that these writers, in fact, are asking an even more urgent question because they're dealing with a much more, in McLuhan's sense, intensified experiment. Like Sandy Stone's article, Will the Real Body Please Stand Up? At least McLuhan had a sense of what his body was. But Sandy Stone saying, well, what is the real body? What does it mean when we occupy many spaces at the same time? When part of our body is physical, and part of our body is electronic, and part of our body is being part of like a data network, like if you use an ATM banking machine, you're part of an electronic database itself. Is that data archive not also part of your experience? And what happens also about those prosthetic memories, and what happens to prosthetic identity itself? What do we mean by the fundamental question what is the body today, and what is the cyber body? So this section on cyber bodies, part six, you know, really puts this question. Did you have your hand up? And with not a bit of exaggeration, the editors, you know, David Bell introduced this book. I think he says in the introduction to the section, I quote, if bodies are conceived as flesh and humanoid bodies, then what extent, to what extent is that body changed, transformed, mutated, or disembodied through connections across cyberspace? And for myself, that's a really, you know, really profound question to put, but I would say that it's also like an innocent question. Because I would say that you know, there's kind of two mutations which are happening now. One mutation is the mutation of the electronic storm, but what about you know, the storm of bioengineering? the storm of genetic engineering itself. And what happens when the storm comes to us is something very seductive, very fascinating. It provides freedom, pass it on. Or in this text, what happens when we become the screen, when we are interfaced with machines as our significant others? What if we don't have just this relationship to technology and machines as like another, but in fact machines become our significant others? And this is a point which is made in Deborah Lufton's article on page 477, an article called The Embodied Computer User. It's also the point made in a different way in Anne Balsamo's article on page 489. The article is titled The Virtual Body in Cyberspace. In both of these essays, our relations with the world are mediated through screens. I mean, both the articles are almost like just the world is suffocated with screens. We have screenal identities, the screen of the computer, of the television, of cinema, of the EMT machine. Our prosthetic is like this kind of lonely prosthetic, the little mouse, clicking in, surfing, eyeballing the screen at incredible s speeds. But what happens when the third article in this section, Sandy Stone's article, you know, Sandy Stone, a transsexual, a person who's writing about like shifting gender, you know, who begins her writing out of like a whole history of herself of being both a, you know, cyber programmer who's worked in the California industry at the beginning of the gaming industry, and at the same time now you know, she thinks about technology from the point of view of like blurred boundaries. What happens when, as Sandy Stone says, sometimes the machines get restless? What happens when the machines get restless to the point that they begin to really work us over?
and we become like the electronic storm field itself. What happens to the body? Now, just going back in history a little bit to Marshall McLuhan, McLuhan said, if technologies are always medical, that they do surgical construction and reconstruction on us, they always hit us like a big buzzsaw, and they're always chopping something. We don't even, you know, we just call it like freedom or facilitation or, you know, getting better network. McLuhan says the body knows better. And when the body is hit by the blast of technology, it does one of two things. Sometimes the body goes numb, like when you get whapped on the head or you get an injury. Your nervous system anesthetizes yourself. You won't feel the pain instantly. So McLuhan says that sometimes the body goes numb for self-protection. Sometimes the body doesn't feel. Sometimes the body anesthetizes itself while it figures out the extent of the injury. And McLuhan says what happens to the body when the body is, gets a sudden wound and you go into like a shock experience is also what cultures do. Sometimes when cultures are hit by really rapid changes in technology, which don't come without any explanation, like you know, genetic engineering, or you find yourself in the, like riding the tip of the electronic storm and you're sort of like, you know, like in a sun cult of images, sometimes whole cultures go numb. They go on passive and they go on like sort of automatic procedures itself. They put the soft matter of the nervous system on the outside. They put the hard shell within. The body is wounded. It's traumatized. It's breaking apart. It doesn't know what's going on. It begins to go on automatic operation itself. It begins to simply go down to basic default functions. It tries to pass time. It recycles and cycles itself. It begins to spin. And McLuhan says the same thing that happens to a body when it gets a sudden injury, physical injury, is also what happens to technology under the impact of, of what happens to culture under the impact of technology. That the whole culture sometimes goes numb. People begin not to feel things and can't feel things. The whole culture itself begins not to feel things. It begins to experiment with itself. It moves towards the growth of a massive entertainment culture, a culture of distraction happens. A culture of distraction for McLuhan would be a culture that is a culture desperately trying to anesthetize itself and to really have some time to figure out what the source of the injury is itself. So Sandy Stone says, asks the question, what happens when the machines get restless? When they will not stay on the outside, but want to process bodies, they want to do surgery on, the, on human culture, and Marshall McLuhan already had an answer in place. He said, think medicine. Think what happens to human beings when they get a sudden physical injury, a traumatic injury. They anesthetize themselves. They go numb. And you pick out this kind of register of this, like in artists, for example, like San Francisco, like those artists, the person that I met who um, he had this artistic experiment that was going on her body. She didn't call it an artistic experiment. It's just I met her one day when I was in a cyber cafe. And she's sitting there, and her friend had arranged for this shit to be an interesting person you talk to, and she comes in, and she, you know, she's really, really uh, fantastically phenomenal tattoos all over her back, like archangel wings all over her back going down her arms itself. And that's really beautiful. And she's sort of sitting, when I came into the cafe, she's sitting in the corner working on a computer itself. She turns around, we have a coffee. And what I notice about her is that she has scars up and down her arms. <coughs> and so I say, oh, well, you know, I didn't want to be in polite because I'm a polite Canadian. But I did say, what's happened with these scars? And she said, oh, that's just, she says, I have a practice, you know, of like wounding myself. And what I do is I take a razor blade and I cut my arm. She says, some of us do this in San Francisco. Oh, can you stand this story? This, this, <laughs> this actually happened. And it really re just took me to thinking of what was going on and what this meant about for her and for culture in general. Says, you know, it's like scratch and burn. Or she says, I you know, slash my arms with a razor blade. And she says, afterwards, you know, she, the practice is you take a little gas and you put it on your arm. And then you put it out. She says, because the whole idea isn't to burn your body up or to destroy yourself. She says, the point is, 
that what you really want, which is what I really want, was I didn't want the pain. I wanted to really to feel something because I don't feel anything. And what I want to feel was the pleasure of the healing process. When the body slowly begins to recuperate itself and the wounds begin to heal itself. When in fact you begin to like feel, you, you just don't feel like in a numb down, anesthetized body, but you can actually feel like the pleasures of the healing process itself. And when she said that to me, I thought, well, here I'm sitting in the middle of Cyber City, in the middle of the tech boom in San Francisco. I'm sitting with a, you know, like a student who's really intelligent, and you know, she's really part of the culture. Her mother was president of an elite Eastern college. So you're talking like, you know, the, you know, like the ascend an ascendant citizen of the empire of the, you know, the techno empire itself. And yet this body and her body, it's a subjective expression of itself was that I am numbed down. I do not feel anything. I feel like I'm going through my life anesthetized, and I desperately would like to feel something, even if only the pleasure of the healing process, which I can only bring on by, in fact, inflicting some pain on myself. So, you know, when I thought about it, I thought, well, this goes like Marshall McLuhan in some ways, you know? It's like numbed down bodies, anesthetized. And what is happening in a technological culture that is shutting some bodies down to this point, where people will do a lot of desperate things just to feel you know, the pleasures of healing once more and just to have the experience of feeling something about your body once more itself. So this kind of registry, this kind of feeling, is what these articles in this section are talking about in cyber bodies. That they're beginning to say, you know, what happens when the body begins to experiment with itself? What happens when the body begins to abuse itself, and begins to run an automatic? What happens when the body begins to, just one sec, when the body begins to view itself, not just in terms of how you view the world through your own eyesight, but what happens when a normal part of living in like in a video surveillance culture, and just a media culture in the sun cult of images, is when you get very used to looking at your body from the outside, saying, what kind of gestures do I have? What kind of bodily, ex you know, what kind of you know, um, impression am I making? You know, putting on your like, screensaver face or your like, career get a job kind of face and saying, here's the kind of the expressions that I have to come out with if I'm going to get the job. And you're simultaneously seeing yourself, both in terms of how you see the world, but also thinking of how significant others are seeing you and judging you. And you begin to think of that sort of, you know, that becomes like sort of second nature itself. What happens when we no longer have simply a body, but we have a network disguised as a body? When we really begin to merge with streams of network and streams of data itself. And the articles in this section in Cyber Bodies want to ask that basic psychological question. Because their point of view is that the our relationship to technology is not simply utilitarian, and it's not just disembodied, but in fact that we are emotionally invested in technology. Like there's a great writer at MIT, I think, Sherry Turkle. And Sherry Turkle says, you know, that when we live in what she calls screen culture, that the characteristic of screen culture from an early age is that we have deep emotional investments in technologies of all sorts. And that that emotional investment of technology also plays back within our body itself. So like in these articles, you know, Deborah Lufton will say, for example, think in your own experience. Like when the network is slow, there's a feeling of frustration. Maybe your experience is different than mine. Like you're using like Vax2, this dead system at Concordia. And you know, just you sit there for five minutes and say, I think something should be happening and nothing's happening feel a tiny little vexation and frustration. Or there's nothing on TV, boredom ensues. Or a computer crashes and you get sort of anxious, particularly if you're finishing a term paper and you haven't done saving at proper intervals. Or something happens to your network connection and you feel sort of disconnected itself. And Diabra Lufton wants to say, well, networks are like that and bodies and networks are like that. The networks also, just like us, they get viruses. They grow ill. They spread plagues. The networks come alive. You know, something is happening in the networks itself 
And the easy relationship between the body and the technology is not so easy just to keep separate any longer. They become intermingled. And they become intermingled really at the level also of emotion. We have identities invested in networks. Yes, I'm sorry. 